All right, so we have the end of day today. We started late at 10.30 because Todd Engel was supposed to be sentenced. Um, even though that was pushed back after they give the schedule to the jury, they can't change it. One of the most important things that had happened inside today, there was a jury question. The jury question was, why can't we see videos from better angles, from positions um, where this witness is talking about? They want to see more of these videos. The judge won't let them answer this question. She answers it herself. She says that's not a reasonable expectation. Most cases don't have video or picture evidence and just testimony. What they are doing inside here, we all know that there is multiple videos. There is photo footage. There is so much footage in this case. She, what she is doing is misleading, purposely misleading the jury to believe that there is not video evidence. What is going on with the prosecution upstairs is they are just bringing in witnesses and showing the same few little clips of videos, few little pictures to get this going. They don't want to bring actual evidence that will go back in the room with the jury because any evidence they do bring in will show the BLM's misconduct. So they're not playing very many videos, they're not putting in the pictures, and they keep going back to the same few pictures. The jury is picking up on this, and, and the judge is actually gets on there and says that's an unreasonable expectation. She also goes to say that don't take anything that the, the prosecution or the defense, the lawyers say as evidence. And she says, if you ever hear an objection or anything like that, don't, um, don't try to understand what the objections are. Uh, don't try to imagine what the answer would be. That's not considered uh, evidence either. So here they're already getting this. Um, let's see, there was something else. They're really preventing any real true evidence from coming into this courtroom. Oh, that's the other thing. So, um, the, one of the witnesses this morning said that he met with the U.S. Attorney's Office yesterday. He met with them yesterday based on the jury questions. Now, this is why they're having the jury ask questions. They can then tailor their approach. So then after they talk to this witness yesterday, he comes in and starts saying things like, I am here to protect, I took an oath to protect the Constitution. He brought up First Amendment, did he say First? I, there's a little confusion whether he said First Amendment or Second Amendment in the courtroom. You know, they are trying to tailor their defense their prosecution to these jury questions. That's what we knew they were doing with the jury questions all along. Um, they're trying to push this through and we're hoping that the jury will see through it. Can I hand that back to you? I think oh, the another, jury has seen through it though based on some of their other questions. Absolutely. Another thing there, all the witnesses say they don't know what time it was. Yes, that's the other thing is they've all been We're back. Well, hopefully this will work. Okay, so first government calls Ranger Edwin Whitaker. He is with the BLM. He was previously a U.S. Border Patrol and ATF. What I am finding out here is the federal government has created their own standing army. They have cre created these people who are used to dealing with um, non-American citizens on the border. Um, they're heavy-handed. They are either Secret Service, Border Patrol, ATF. This is not what you think of when you think BLM. Me living in rural Idaho, when I think BLM, I think someone who's going to come out and make sure that I've got the right amount of birds for my duck hunting, um, make sure I'm using the correct shot. I do not think of a Border Patrol agent ready to take my life. That is what the BLM is nowadays. That is what the Park Service is. And it seems that it is going at an alarming rate. <clears throat> he is a canine handler that conveniently showed up on the, the 10th. Um, I believe that they're picking and choosing people to bring in. He showed up on the 10th, so he can't be asked anything about the 9th, even though we're not allowed to ask it anyways. He talked about the cover and any of the long guns could go through the trucks. That it was a powder keg out there that day. And there was women and children in that crowd. He wouldn't be able to take... <laughs>
to take the shot if he wanted to because there was men and women uh, and children in the in the crowd and the only way he would have been able to take that shot is if it was clear he talks about how all of his bullets he has to account for he was worried about ricochets he said he signed up to enforce federal law and uphold the Constitution. This guy and his entire testimony today was formatted because of the jury questions yesterday. <clears throat> he goes to identify Stephen Stewart, Scott Drexler, and Eric Parker. Um, they, he testifies that he believed uh, Stephen Stewart had a shotgun that day. I don't know why a shotgun from a northbound bridge at that far away would have been a threat, but apparently... Uh, he also talks about a man, a man with sunglasses and a beige vest. This is Todd Engel and Ricky Loveland. I am really in shock and awe at how much Todd Engel goes on trial upstairs here. They have waited until he's out of the room. We all know that Todd Engel was filmed the entire time he was up there. But they are taking that out of the equation and using all of him against these other guys. They are using false facts. They are manipulating the evidence and using it against these guys on a man that uh, had already gone through trial and wasn't found guilty on everything. Um, he said, another man with a firearm, a gun, he was always slung heavier, pointed it at anyone. Okay, so this gentleman goes around and he talks about... One man walking around with his gun and he's like, oh, you know, moving around. And his movement, he's saying that he's consistently pointing his weapon. That's what they're saying of all of these guys, that even just their movements, if you, like, if my, I had a rifle on a sling and I moved this direction, I would have pointed my weapon at the cameraman. And that's what they're saying. They're using um, the smoke and mirrors tactic here. They're using a play on words, smoke and mirrors to confuse this jury, and hopefully we're thinking that it doesn't work. This gentleman testifies, I deal with drug smil smugglers with, with hundreds of pounds of drugs going on high speed chases knowing that they are armed. But this situation here was the most scared he's ever been in his life. Um, Tanasi gets up and asks if he was aware the operation was over on the 11th. He says no. I think what is going on inside, even though they're preventing <clears throat> the defense for talking about the heavy handedness, what they are finding out is none of these guys had all the information. The communication on the ICP and their entire team was extremely lacking. And I think that that played a huge part in, in the way that they were dealt with. At one point in cross-examination, um, Tanasi was asking about Nevada Highway Patrol being up on the bridge. He's got binoculars. He's seeing, he's talking about Todd Engel and Ricky Loveland. He says he sees the top of the car, but he refuses to say he saw the guys in the green vest. We know we're standing with Todd and Ricky the entire time. Nadia Med gets up and testifies in court that, well, she gets up and says this statement. It was not your honor, kind of giggly, um, with an attitude and, um, Tanasi calmly says counsel is testifying and the judge kind of ignores it and continues on. If that was Tanasi that had done that, she would have called a sidebar and he would have gotten harassed. We've seen it happen to Tanasi very, uh, quite a few times, but Nadia Ahmed can get up and do that, uh, especially when she's uh, losing ground on her, vict or her witness. The next trick they're playing, they have no concept of the time of day. They are being hostile witnesses because they they can't give any detail. They can give detail about the guys. They can give detail about them pointing weapons. They can't give you detail about time of day. They can't even tell you accurately what truck they were behind. They're having trouble even marking things on the screen. I believe that this is on purpose, coaching by the prosecution so that they can't be cross-examined properly. Um, they talk about the fatal funnel. Um, and he keeps saying that he can't uh, see it with this, that they controlled the high ground. Leventhal gets to bring in the aerial footage. Um, he starts bringing in the aerial footage, talking about the horses were coming into the wash, trying to play this. The judge calls for a sidebar. 
Um, Nadia Med, I believe, said that he wasn't here at this time. Leventhal in front of the jury says, I'm trying to prove that they didn't always have the high ground. Although we all know that the Mesa was the actual high ground. He talks about the plane in the air that was objected to. There was a sidebar and he couldn't continue that line of questioning either. So once again inside, we are seeing the judge play another prosecutor, making sure that none of this information gets to the jury. Um, <clears throat> The jury questions um, for that one, let's see. One asked if they could see through the southbound and the northbound con uh, concrete barriers. If you had a clear shot, could he have taken it? He said he would not have shot unless he had a clear shot. Can the jury ever see from the officer's position? The judge answers this. this is, it is unusual to have this many photos and videos. They cannot provide this video to you. This is another time that the judge is inter interfering in this and she is um, trying to mislead the jury into believing that they're not hiding things from them. <clears throat> they asked if anyone carrying a weapon was a threat. Um, do you feel the defendant's <clears throat> intent was to kill officers and federal agents on that day? He says yes. Hmm. So then we go into the next one. The government calls Ranger Martinez. Ranger Martinez was a much different witness for the government. You could tell by his body language, he didn't seem happy about being there. He had kept his head down most of the time. He's from Anchorage, Alaska, a real, uh, <clears throat> been with the BLM for 14 years. He worked at the DOD in Utah, the Department of Com Commerce, and Department of Homeland Security. So once again, here we have, um, a militarized BLM force and park ranger force for the federal government. This is Agenda 21, folks. They have taken over the land in the West, and they are about to um, put militarized force on it and get keep us off of the land. If you believe that this is still public land, you should probably go check it and, and do a little research on the BLM. Do a little research on what the BLM did to a teenager on a four-wheeler out in Red Rock around the time of the Bundy Ranch. You know, you can look into these things and find this kind of um, misuse of force all over with the BLM. <clears throat> Tanasi at one point asked this gentleman, if a Metro officer came by and told you to put your weapons away, that was immediately objected to in another sidebar and he couldn't continue that line of questioning either. This gentleman got on the stand and testified he could see Eric Parker's gun protruding the other side of the concrete barrier. Um, he, he was on the stand very short. He, they did use him to identify quite a few people, but I really loved his answers to a lot of the jury questions. Um, what, number one of his jury questions, how were you communicating with the different law enforcement on the scene? He said when Metro showed up, they started issuing orders. Prior to that day, they had zero communication with Metro and NHP. And then he said that a Metro officer asked him to put down his gun. At this time, Cregan starts talking over him so that they, the jury can't hear his answer. And the judge stops him and says, I just want to know how, verbally over the radio. And he says verbally once, that one time. They asked who his supervisor was. That was Logan Briscoe. I think this person's been on top of it. They want to know the supervisor of everyone. I don't know if they've even got out that Dan Love was the supervisor of the entire thing, which I believe that they were trying to ask the whole time. Now, the next jury question was, what does the term non-responsive and hostile witness mean? No one in this courtroom said hostile witness today, but the jury themselves wrote out a question that said hostile witness because even them themselves saw the fact that anywhere the defense was trying to ask questions, they were being evaded by the people on the stand. The judge says, don't worry about what objections are and don't try to guess the answers. Don't worry about what non-responsive is or hostile witness. That's for me to worry about. All you guys need to worry about is the evidence that is entered. Once again, she is trying to mislead the jury.